The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. We're in our series learning about major lessons from the minor prophets. So there were also major prophets. Last week, Pastor Kevin introduced us to Amos, one of the minor prophets. They're not minor because their lessons weren't important. They were minor because they just wrote less. So if there's minor and major, Obadiah must be a micro prophet. (laughs) He wrote 21 verses, one book. You can read it. Go home and read it. You can and you should. So what's the point of Obadiah? Here's a guy um, that God just decided to use to give a message to a people that he was really angry at. They had done things over time to his people. And one thing you don't do is harm God's children. That really upsets him. And so we don't know anything about this Obadiah. There's 13 Obadiahs in the Old or in the Bible. He's one of them, but there's no way to show that he's any of the others. He's, we don't know his history. We don't know if he was a farmer. We don't know anything. He must have lived around Jerusalem somewhere. But why was God so angry with the Edomites? Why did he give Obadiah this message that we're going to explore this morning um, to let him know justice will be done? Well, there's a number of things we need to look at. We're going to show you a map here. And this is the kingdom of Edom. And what you can see is up here is Jerusalem. And one of the things God was upset with originally was way over here in the land of Egypt when the people are finally set free and they start their wandering and they come over here. The course they want to take is up here through Edom alongside the Dead Sea and cross the River Jordan. They get right here in the land of Edom, this big yellow uh, land right here. And the Edomites say, you're not coming through here. They had to go all the way around and cross up here. That's where it started. Now, one of the things we know too, history tells us that the Edomites are descended from Esau and Judah, Israel, is descended from his brother, Jacob. And so other things that really made God angry at the Edomites, they joined in others, other armies coming against Jerusalem to the extent that they not only stole stuff, fought, and killed people, they stopped those trying to flee to safety. They cut them down on the road. They captured them, gave them back, back to uh, the enemy of Jerusalem. They bragged. You'll read it in the book of Obadiah. You'll read how they gloat over their triumphs. They saw themselves as high and mighty. They, they lived here in what is modern-day Petra in what would we call the land of Jordan now, the country of Jordan. They lived there. And it was cut out of rock, and they'd be way back in the rock and and lived up high. It's not the developed city you can see there now as a tourist, but it still was hard to get to. And they thought that made them special. That made them great. They had a history of being wise, but wise in the world, not wise in the Lord. For all these reasons, God said, Obadiah, go tell them they're in big, big trouble. That's what we know about Obadiah. So what are some of the major lessons we can learn from the book of Obadiah, from this prophet. First of all, we learn that we reap what we sow. If you have your bulletins, you can fill in your words there. We reap what we sow. I just want to mention also, this isn't karma. People call it karma all the time. Karma is a religious principle in Buddhism and, or Hinduism especially, where how you live this life here will decide if you come back as a bug to your next reincarnated life, all of that. That's karma. We're talking about a principle built on farming, on growing. So you reap what you sow. If you prepare the land and you put seeds in it and you water it, you'll reap. Something good will come. And so it's where does pride come into this? We're going to walk through that today. It says in Obadiah 15, the day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your head. That's justice. God is perfectly just. 
Paul goes on to confirm this in 2 Corinthians. He says, whoever sows sparingly, this is the flip side, will also reap sparingly. And whoever reaps generously, or sows generously, Miss Brent, will also reap generously. And he says it again in Galatians. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. A principle there we know is when we have children, if I pour into my kids the very nature of Christ by loving them the way the Lord loves us, and they're raised with that, they have this capacity to develop an identity. We all develop an identity. Everybody does. It's just, what's it going to be based on? And God's plan is that it would be based on him as our Abba Father and Jesus as our Savior. So whatever is planted in there will grow that. If it's not, not planted, it won't grow. It'll have to happen a different way. And some, of, some folks have a parent that never planted in them and they feel guilty in later in life and say, how come I don't feel these things for my parent? I'll say, because they didn't plant it. That's how it works. It's just this principle. We reap what we sow. Here's another lesson from Obadiah. Our hearts will deceive us when we push God out. Our hearts will deceive us when we push God out. I want to read you something that Timothy Keller wrote, and it really struck me as kind of capturing this. He said, it is the normal state of the human heart to try to build its identity around something besides God. Spiritual pride is the illusion that we are competent to run our own lives, achieve our own sense of self-worth, and find a purpose big enough to give us meaning in life without God. Soren Kierkegaard, the philosopher, says that the normal human ego is built on something besides God, and I'd say that's true. It searches for something that will give it a sense of worth, a sense of specialness, and a sense of purpose, and builds itself on that. That's the identity who I am, what defines me, what I think, how I live my life. That's identity. And of course, as we are often reminded, if you try to put anything in the middle of the place that was originally made for God, it is going to be too small. It's going to rattle around in there. And I'll show you how this has worked in my life. I brought a very old box from my house. It's full of very old stuff. And that identity I was talking about, I want you to think of it this way. It works a lot like a vacuum. As an infant, you're born and you have this vacuum. And it's going to draw in the programming. It's going to draw in the things that you receive from your caregivers and those around you. And it's going to help form that identity that becomes who you are and who you understand yourself to be. It just does that. It's, it's just this vacuum. And it was designed by God for God. But if God isn't in the picture, it's going to take whatever's available. It just is. It's always there. You know, I learned this after the fact. All my life growing up, as soon as I could really think these thoughts, I wanted to be really great at something. I never knew why. And I was so frustrated because I never was really great at anything. I'm still not great at anything. And it used to frustrate me, and I didn't understand it, and it would be painful at times. I'd compete in all these things, and, and, and it just never worked. I never became the best or great. I never understood what was driving it. I didn't know where pride was working in that. And so what I did is I lived my life all the way up through high school and after, and when I finally found Christ, it shifted. What I did was I did what pride does. I built different narratives around special times in my life. Different narratives, and they were pride-driven. Let me show you the first one I came across. This is a go-kart trophy <laughs> for driving a go-kart. It's a real trophy from 1962. It weighs something. This is real metal with real wood. And here's what it says. Some of you don't know what that is, I know. Here's what it says, KRDC winner 1962. Let me tell you what my narrative was. It makes me sick to think about it sometimes. I turned this into, I grew up racing. I was around racetracks. Oh yeah, speed, I love speed. <laughs> you think you drive fast? Let me drive your car. I'll show you how it works. I grew up racing. And we did have a go-kart shop. And I milked it and milked it and milked it for years. And I, did, I just did. I didn't even know why I did. And the Lord came into my life. Can I tell you the truth about this trophy? This was a day at Adams Cart Track that still exists in Riverside, California. And it was a fun day. They had it once a year. 
And I was on a team with my brother, a kid's team. And what you did is you did one lap around the track, ate a hot dog, tagged your brother. He did one lap around the track. He ate a hot dog. Who never finished that second hot dog first won. This is a second place trophy. There were two teams. This is the truth. But when I told the story, it was, oh, I'm going 50, 60, maybe 70, 80 miles an hour down that back straight. Seven, you know, 10 years old. No, I wasn't. I was going 25 and I wet my pants. <laughs> That's the truth. And I wish I could say it was over, but pride still is in there. Here's a water polo trophy, also made from wood, metal, heavy objects, things like that. Valley League champs, 1966 C. I play water polo. We won the championship. I was second team all league goalie that year. Oh, yeah. Just soak that in for a sec. <laughs> I'm kind of a big deal. And I would tell people over the years, the narrative developed, this is my freshman year, into, yeah, I was on a championship water polo team, all league, barely missed first team. Five of the guys went on to Division I scholarships. Yeah. That's how it was. <laughs> you want to know the truth? I couldn't swim well, so they stuck me in the goal because they felt bad for me. <laughs> and I was second team all league because we had a great team, not me. We had a great team and we won everything. Here's the talent I did have. I had a high pain tolerance. <laughs> I can't tell many balls they bounced off my face and my head. They're like, that guy stopped another one. He's awesome. <laughs> I'm just there going, no. <laughs> How about this one? This really is a big deal. <clears throat> First annual Mount San Antonio College Ironman Relays, 1969. A call went out around the San Gabriel Valley to all the high schools in the area. Come to the first annual Iron Man relays. The relays were 10 events from weightlifting to throwing a javelin to running the hurdles to, to walking on your hands to doing all these crazy events. And I won this. This is first place. I won the whole darn thing. And I milked it. I also got an offer, a college scholarship offer, sort of off that. I milked that. Because that's the holy grail, right? If your kids are in sports, it's like, they're, they're going to get an offer oh, to college. Oh my gosh. And so I got mine. You want to know the real story? I did win this. We were the only high school that showed up. <laughs> I was a junior captain of the track team because I was a field event guy. I was a junior. The only others who would go with me to this thing were eight freshmen. And the letter I got as a result was a letter of interest from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. <laughs> but, down, but years down the line, it was, oh yeah, I got an offer. How about you? Did you ever get an offer? Because you know what I was doing the whole time? I got this from Francis Chan. I love when he did this. I wanted to shine it here. Light on me. This just, here, look at me. Look at, see, aren't I something? I changed all the narratives to make the light shine on me because what I suspected I would, was inside couldn't make the grade. It didn't cut it. But you know what it should have been? It should have been shined on the cross over there. That's where it should be shined. And in order to do that, we gotta walk with Jesus. Otherwise, pride is right here. I'll just, I'll just suck that up. I'll put that in this bag. And I'll move you out, Lord. But it goes, it goes further than that. Now, now it's about YouTube, right? Get yourself on YouTube. I'm on YouTube. Did you know that? I am. I found, I saw me preaching on a YouTube 2013. That's pretty special. Unless you look around the other YouTubes around me where mine is, and you can kind of get the context. Let me tell you the things on YouTube, around my YouTube, that have more hits than I do. The Amish way of canning. <laughs> I didn't even know they had their own way. And now I actually am curious. How about this one? Apple picking with the kids, a home video. 
This one, I love it. And there's like eight of these. A typical visit with our grandson, Wyatt. And this one just, I don't know, Lynn and I on a drive to the store after a snowstorm. <laughs> they all have more hits than mine. Here's the worst, maybe. Here's this confluence. There's an Elvis impersonator doing Johnny B. Good right near mine that has more hits than I do. And here's the rub. And this is true. You know what his name is? Dennis McFadden. <laughs> true story. Pride. Pride's about the narrative. It's not about the mementos. It's not about what you have. What you have isn't bad. Mementos aren't bad. There's not bad to it. Pride is the one that trips us up. It creates a narrative that takes you away from who you really are. And so how is God gonna use me if getting to me has to go through all these false narratives I've created because of pride has taken hold? In Obadiah 3, we read this. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? They were up high. They saw that as that elevating them. And so they could have this arrogant attitude. They could boast. They could brag. And not only just brag about themselves, but they could revel in the destruction of others. And pride will do that. Pride is right there waiting to do that. So a major lesson, another one from Obadiah. If we reject pride and embrace humility, God is merciful and he restores us. If we reject pride, if I, if I just try to keep this thing shut off and I stay focused on scripture and focus on the Lord and embrace humility, God is merciful and restores us. Obadiah 17. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy and Jacob will possess his inheritance. God's saying, Edomites, you're gonna lose everything. You're gonna lose, justice will be done. In my timing and my way, but it will be done. See, humility in antiquity, in the days of old, humility wasn't what it is now. Humility then was a symbol, at the time of certainly Jesus, of Rome's brutalizing power to strip away dignity respect and value and cause unbearable physical pain as a sign to you who dare come against Rome and then as a sign to anyone else who would even entertain such an idea. That was humility. The ancients also drew a line between greatness and honor and reputation, Aristotle would say. You know, it's about your reputation, your honor, your greatness. We're all about that. Humility, the way we think of it now, was frowned upon. It was disgusting in those days. There was sort of a public humility thing you could do to gain favor, which is another form of pride. And Jesus went on the cross willingly and he died a horrible, brutalizing death and much to everyone's surprise, it didn't do what the Roman crucifixions did. It introduced humility as coming straight through our Lord and Savior as a trait to be sought, to be admired, not only in ourselves, but in others. And don't we do that now? When we come across someone who's serving so well and we see how humble they are, it just changes everything, doesn't it? It moves us. It would have never done it back then, but it does it now because of Jesus Christ. Achieving greatness in the eyes of society is not our goal anymore as followers of Jesus. It's not our goal anymore. I don't even know what greatness is for sure. But I know that each of us has a path. And in Ephesians 2.10, we can find what our path kind of is made of. And it says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So we have a path. Everybody who's ever born has a path. You can't be born without God saying you can be born. People have sex. God makes babies. That's just the way it is. And there's a path. And so we look to him for the path. If we don't, this happens. It'll take in anything else, any path, anywhere. It just will. And we gotta be careful we don't go too far with humility. There's a false humility. There's a false humility. Just for fun, Pastor Keith and I periodically do a humble off. <laughs> Who can be more humble? <laughs> we'll go into a meeting and there's one ratty old chair left and Keith will say, I'll, I'll take the ratty chair Oh, there'll be a nice one and a ratty one. He'll say, I'll take the ratty one because I'll say, well, that's all right, I'll sit on the floor. 
He goes, dang, you won. You can even have pride and humility. You can. But what would Obadiah say to us if he was here today? We're going to go over and sit on a rock and we're going to check this out. What would Obadiah say to us? What would he say to you? If he, if he were here right now through this message God gave him, I think he might say this, be willing to humble yourself, grow and change. Humble yourself, grow and change. I wrestle with that. As a pastor, I counseled pastors for years before I became one. I used to say, they're so prideful. I don't ever want to be one of those. Here I am. And we do. How big's your church? How's your book doing? Oh, how many hits for your sermon? By the way, mine was 22. <laughs> don't go out and start hitting on it because I'll know you did it out of pity. Your destiny in him is before you. Let's bring the word back, destiny. What is a destiny? It's the events that will necessarily happen in your future. We're partners with God in this destiny. That's what Ephesians 2.10 is about. Everyone born has a plan. There's a path God designed for you to take, to, to love him wholly, to serve him wholly, to bring others to him. That's what the Hebrew nation was about. That's what we're about today through the new covenant through Jesus Christ. That's our destiny. We need to know our destiny. Pride gets in the way. Obadiah might also say that. Trust that when you submit to the Lord's guidance and plan for your life, you will sense his holy touch on all you do. One of the meanings of the word touch is effect. The effect, the touch. One of the meanings of the word holy is dedicated or devoted to the service of God. Then I can see his holy touch in my life as, Lord, how are you influencing me? H how are you walking with me? What are you saying to me that's helping me serve you and serve others better and better? How are you doing that? I want your holy touch on my thoughts, my words, and my actions. When we do that, it means that we live a life that... that is deeper and richer than we could ever imagine. Sure, it doesn't have the quick hit and the quick fix and the burst of fire of, of pride and adulation. It doesn't. But it sinks these rich, deep roots like the tree in Psalm 1 along the river. Roots to just go down and tap the water. The living water. That's what it is. And what else would Obadiah say? He'd say, be vigilant and alert. Our culture is immersed in pride and pride doesn't even have to sneak around anymore. It's a value. It's sought after. It is celebrated. It's more dangerous now than I, than I ever dreamed it could be. And it's waiting. That vacuum's waiting to turn on any time. It's powered up. It's ready. If I'm not careful, if you're not careful, it's right here waiting to draw us. And we can become Edomites in this culture, in our lives, in this world. And where we're covering up who we really are. And God's saying, no, don't do that. I love who you really are. I want you just as you are. So that I can not only use you for my plan, but bless you richly and deeply. That's my encouragement to you today. From Obadiah, Take that from with you today as you leave here from this place. Who you are right now is more than enough for God to use. We don't need a false narrative. We don't need pride to make us anything else. We're great just as we are. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this. We are so grateful. Lord, that just as we are, it's more than enough. We come against pride by the blood of Jesus Christ and the new covenant. That if there's any pride in my life and any person here, if there's any pride in their life, currently in their life or sneaking up on them, we ask you to turn it away and make us humble again. Soften us in your presence. And then you open up to us our destiny through your holy touch, our path to do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. We thank you for this. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone together said, amen. amen.